I welcome you again for this second lecture on wave propagation for this course. First lecture just now we have uh, talked in the lecture 9. So, we are in the last chapter of this module 1 which is wave propagation and the last top, uh, lecture. So, with this, to, this lecture the module 1 will get completed. So, let us uh, have during wave propagation in the first lecture that is lecture number 9 what we have talked introduction to wave propagation, 1D wave propagation in elastic road, 3D wave propagation in elastic infinite medium and then we talk about 3D wave propagation in elastic half space. So, the last part that is wave propagation in elastic half space, semi infinite elastic half space, we will continue from there. So, last lecture, uh, last topic was partly covered in the last lecture and partly will be covered in this lecture. So, topics which we are going to talk is starting from wave propagation in semi infinite elastic half space. Dispersion of surface waves will be covered, phase and group velocities for surface waves and attenuation of surface wave material and radiation damping. So, basically in this lecture in the last three topics we are going to talk much about the surface waves. The first one is like uh, how the surface waves are generated which we dis, uh, started in the last uh, lecture and continue here. So, continue wave progression semi and infinite elastic half space. So, in practice if you consider infinite elastic body then you consider only two waves but it have little significance why because ultimately your waves will travel from the earth and the wave need to come at the top ground level. So, when the wave need to reach if suppose your wave is not reaching at the ground level and if it is travelling inside the earth only then we do not have much concern because our buildings our structures are on the, on the surface they are not going to be affected. So, if that would have been scenario that would have been better, but ultimately what happens the waves due to earthquake which are travelling inside the earth they ultimately come on the surface and they start damage the uh, you know the structures. So, that is the issue here. So, again for we assume as uh, discussed in the last lecture we assume that our medium is homogeneous isotropic and elastic. So, assuming that medium is homogeneous isotropic and elastic medium. So, here this is a wave propagation in semi infinite half space you have x direction y direction. So, you see wave front there is a no change in y direction y direction it is same, but the in x direction this amplitude may be different this may be different they are in this case amplitude may be varying along the x direction. In the z direction it is again varying you have the maximum here and then decreasing here. So, variation in this case we are considering only in x and z direction, but not in y direction. So, that is the uh, like uh, for semi infinite elastic half space. So, continue with this the third wave generated. So, we already discussed now the issue is this one there are three waves one is a uh, Vc another is Vs and last one is Vr. What is their wave velocity is related? So, this graph suggests you how the wave velocities are related and they are linked with the Poisson's ratio. So, there are three curves in this case one is P wave which is velocity in the P wave is in this case we say v, Vs Vc some text write Vp. So, Vp P velocity in this case is same as Vc compression wave in this we are considering Vc. Okay. And the velocity S wave is denoted as Vs and R wave is denoted as V subscript capital R. Here uh, Vc and the ratio of Vc or Vs we already discussed that is nothing but 2 1 minus nu 1 minus nu divided by 1 minus twice nu. So, this is the ratio here. So, if I put nu equal to 0 what will I will get root 2 for nu equal to so this value this value is nothing but root 2 this value root 2 and as nu increases particularly when nu become 0 what will happen when nu, uh, nu become 0 0.5 so denominator will become in uh, 0 and it go to infinity. So, 0 0.5 this ratio V p by V s is going to infinity while s will be throughout because V s by V s will be 1 only if we talk about relative wave velocity see V r is here V capital R is relative wave velocity. So, relative wave velocity this is different than V r we use V small r this is velocity in the road 
it is compression velocity in the road. So, when we use a small subscript r that will be treated as a velocity in the road while capital r will be rel f a velocity. Okay. So, rel f a velocity and we already discussed that your v r will be always less than v s it is though as the Poisson's ratio increases when Poisson's ratio around 0.5 you get almost same. Okay. So, both almost merge, but uh, if 0 then you have little difference around 0 0.91 or so. So, this value is around 0 0.91. So, this is the relation between uh, V c V s as a result V c is the highest value V s uh, less than V c and V V r is the least one. So, relative velocity is the smallest. So, as a, this graph is also saying and we discussed in the earlier lectures also because the P waves travels the fastest. So, the P waves are the first waves to arrive on any station when an earthquake come. First P wave will come, then shear wave V s will follow and uh, finally, rel f will come, rel f wave. However, this is the arrival time of the waves, but the amplitudes are different. Amplitude you will see that uh, the uh, amplitude is the highest for surface wave which we are going to discuss later in the next slide. So, I will skip this one. Uh, now, one of the uh, like topic which is we call dispersion of surface waves which is very important and this dispersion is basically applicable for surface waves only. Okay. Uh, this dispersion phenomena is not for body waves. So, this is we need to understand this is for surface wave. Even for surface wave for a homogeneous half space the rel f wave velocity is related to a body wave velocity and they are related what we call the by Poisson's ratio. So, the rel f wave velocity is linked with the Poisson's ratio. The rel f wave velocity in a homogeneous half space is independent of the frequency. So, when you have and here one thing important what we say homogeneous if your medium is homogeneous rel f wave is a surface wave, but still uh, they will be they, they, they will not be dependent on frequency. The uh, contrary to this the velocity of the love wave on other hand varies with frequency between upper and lower limit. So, the issue is here rel f wave will not be varying with the frequency in homogeneous medium, but love waves whether it is homogeneous or heterogeneous medium they their velocity will be changing with the frequency. And we defined dispersion is a phenomena in which waves of different frequency or different wavelength propagate at different velocity. So, the velocity will be depend on your frequency on what frequency your wave is traveling. So, at different frequency the waves will travel at different velocity and this is what we about surface wave not bold for body waves. So, the as a result uh, this this phenomena is called dispersion. If your dispersion means wave velocity changing with the frequency if wave velocity is not changing with frequency then we say it is non dispersive. So, as a result your uh, rel f waves love waves are always dispersive whether your medium are uh, you know homogeneous or heterogeneous. However, rel f waves in a homogeneous half space are non dispersive. If you have homogeneous medium then it is non dispersive. Same thing for rel f wave they will be dispersive rel f wave will be dispersive for what they will be dispersive. So, uh, or I can write it here. So, rel f waves they will be dispersive for heterogeneous material. So, in the sense you have a condition for rel f wave whether it will be dispersive or non dispersive that will depend on your medium. If medium is homogeneous non dispersive medium is heterogeneous dispersive, but love wave will be always dispersive irrespective of your type of medium. Again the rel f waves if you have long wavelength that means low frequency then they will travel fastly and if you have the short wavelength that is high frequency then they travel uh, so. So, that means if your yeah like you know that uh, you have this uh, uh, surface waves which is traveling very fast at a very fast rate in this medium in a particular medium then you can say they are traveling at a very low frequency. But if they are in the same medium 
if they are traveling at a slow speed then we can say they are traveling at a uh, uh, like you know the at high frequencies so it is opposite so at what frequency they are traveling now since the, the velocities of both relative end and decrease with increasing frequency so as a result the low frequency components produce can be expected to arrive first at the site so first low frequency component will come then higher frequency components this thing we already discussed so the tendency to spread the seismic energy over time as in important uh, uh, effect of dispersion so after the dispersion the next issue is phase and group velocities and again these issues are for the surface waves only not for body wave the solution for the relative wave velocity vr and love wave velocity vl they are based on the assumption of the harmonic loading which produces in infinite wave train the velocities which is like this vr and vl they are nothing but they are called phase velocity so phase velocity is the velocity of the relative wave and love wave but what happens they they these waves i uh, prefer to travel in a group okay so as a result when they are traveling in the group their behavior is different than the the waves individual wave is traveling so as a transient may produce a packet of waves with similar frequencies if you have a packet of waves and these packet of waves they should travel with the similar frequency then only we club together and this packet of wave tra uh, travels at a speed what we call the group velocity so group velocity means the velocity of a group of waves is traveling together okay and naturally when they are traveling together then they need to talk to each other they are not independent so group velocity is given by this relation where c is is called phase velocity which could be either vr or vl so c may be uh, if you have relative wave then vr if you have love wave then vl so c is known to you okay and dc by dk is the rate of uh, 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 uh this uh, uh, so rate of traveling and here k is a called wave number and this wave number is nothing but omega by vr if you have uh, relative wave or omega by vl so this is the wave number so now here the value of because dc by dk it is negative this this quantity dc by dk is negative so this is dc by dk this is negative and this is as a negative and once you have negative that means your cg is going to be less than c so the, because as a dc by dk is zero if this is zero then d, uh, uh, what will happen cg will be same as a c that means group velocity and phase velocity are same but in general because dc by dk is less than zero as a result group velocity is lower than the phase velocity that means your cg will be less than c so this is the condition here so this was about phase and group velocity now one of the important issue for the surface wave is attenuation of course it is applicable for body waves also but we are going to discuss for the surface wave as for attenuation is concerned hmm, attenuation literal meaning you know understand what is the meaning of attenuation oops so this is always like hitting here attenuation attenuation means reduction red reduction in something attenuate even suppose if i see this light and if i go away from this light what will happen uh, if i go far away then its intensity will decrease that is basically attenuation so if you are near to the source then uh, you get maximum intensity the same thing happens with the earthquake also if you are near to epicenter if suppose an earthquake originate in the himalaya and if you are in the himalayan region only then it is expected that uh, if we do not count local site effect then the uh, this maximum intensity will be the near the source but if you go away from the source then what will happen intensity decreases and that is basically attenuation so when the uh, uh, when the elastic waves travel through the real medium then they attenuate with the distance so decrease with the distance intensity decrease with the distance and this attenuation can be attributed to two sources one of which involve the what is called the material through which the waves travel and another is called geometry of the wave propagation so the first one is called material damping what is damping you know what is damping i think we discussed earlier damping is nothing but damping if i define that is nothing but a uh, dissipation of energy dissipation of energy that is the meaning of the damping if any system have the damping 
so it will dissipate energy so this dissipations are done in two form one is called material damping and another is called radiation damping so in the next slides we are going to discuss these both in detail so first thing is material damping in the real materials part of elastic energy of trailing waves is always co converted to heat there is a loss or in fact what i say you can understand when the a uh, waves is passing through a material then this material is trying to absorb some of the energy so like you know that uh, if you have uh, springs uh, below this uh, uh, seat of a cycle then uh, if you ride then spring uh, like will be kind of a shocker so that will uh, uh, eat up some some of the energy so that will uh, try to reduce the jerk so similarly when the waves elastic waves passes through the material then the material uh like some of the energy converted into heat and this conversion decrease in the amplitude of the wave so what will happen it will go in the form as a when the wave travel further then there will be decrease in the amplitude and there is one thing what is called viscous damping which is easy to understand mathematically convenience so that is normally used for dissipation of elastic energy and when we consider the viscous damping then one of the model which is used uh, like is called kelvin vogert solids in kelvin vogert solids you have one spring and another dashboard kelvin vogert solids and so it is in uh, this uh, this can be explained from this next slide here so this is a kelvin vogert solid here you have two layers hmm? in this two layers you have one spring which is represented by its shear modulus g and you have damper which is represented by viscosity so here g represent your elastic shear modulus g is nothing but shear modulus and what is in this figure eta eta is simply viscosity so g will represent your strength while viscosity will come damping properties so let's say if i have this element which get deformed in x direction Uh, with an amount d u, u is particle displacement in x direction, and so uh, you have d z and d x. Thin element of Kelvin Vogert solid, which is subjected to horizontal shearing. Total resistance to shearing deformation will be given by the sum of elastic component as well as viscous components. So how it is done? It is here. So total shear stress is g into gamma. and eta into del gamma by delta t what is gamma here gamma is nothing but shear strain shear strain so the first component is proportional to shear strain while the second component is proportional to the rate of change of shear strain with time so this way suppose if you do not have viscosity then your relationship is simplified as tau into g into gamma but because the materials have the damping or so in the viscous form or other forms then we need to use the second term also in this equation so with the continue with this so gamma can be represented in a sinus for harmonic excitation gamma equal to gamma not sin omega t and as a result the equation number this tau will be g into gamma not sin omega t and the second term is gamma uh, omega eta into gamma zero cos omega t so that means it will consist of the shear stre stress will be coming from both elastic component as well as viscosity component so they both together kelvin elements so what we happens like if you draw stress and strain relation so let's uh, work on the stress strain relation that means to and u this is called stresses loop either you will consider f or tau so both are not considered if you consider force then we consider displacement if we consider stress then we consider strain so let's come consider as a stress strain loop so a time being for simplicity i can remove that we are not considering force displacement right now we are considering stress and strain relationship <coughs> in this stress strain relationship what do you have you have a loop area of this loop the area of this loop which is shaded is given as a del w what is w w is the area of this triangle 
and this ratio del w by w divided by 4 pi is called nothing but what we call is damping ratio. Yeah, it is given del w is here. So, this is damping ratio. What is jai? Jai is nothing but damping ratio. And this can be also derived and once we, we, we write it here, w is the total energy which is half g gamma naught square. What is g? g is shear modulus. What is gamma naught? Gamma naught will be the maximum value here, this corresponding to this point gamma naught, this will be gamma naught. So, the strain, the total energy stored in the one cycle will be this, damping ratio is given by 1 for del w over w. So, as you ultimately end up n omega over 2 g. What is n? n eta, sorry eta is viscosity. This eta is, we already discussed nothing but viscosity. Viscosity. Ha, equation 4 indicates that dissipated energy is proportional to the frequency of loading. So, what happens here? Damping ratio, which you are getting is jai is proportional to omega. However, when the, for the real soil, when the experiments was conducted, then it has been found that damping ratio is independent of the frequency. So, to make it independent of frequency, another form is used, which is called like uh, stress damping. So, the damping ratio is independent of frequency, it has been observed and to make this damping ratio independent of frequency, one th thing is used where what is called hysteretic damping. So, I think this is missing that is called hysteretic damping. In case of hysteretic damping, hysteretic damping, this damping ratio is not dependent on frequency. So, for the soil it is more applicable than the viscous damping. Viscous damping is more for the concrete and steel. So, this was all about material damping, the first part. Now, what happens? The part of the energy which get attenuate is due to the spreading of the waves. When the waves get spread, then what happens? So, some since metal damping absorbs some of the elastic energy of a stress wave, the specific energy that is what is specific energy? That is energy per unit volume decreases as the waves travel through a material and the specific energy can also decrease by another common fin mechanism which is pure geometric origin and this decrease in specific can occurs at the area of the road increases. So, when the ro road area is increases, what will happen? Suppose this is my road, hmm? if the area is constant then it is ok, but if I increase the area of the road, so what will happen? Because the waves is traveling initially like this, then they start uh, spreading and then when they start spreading, then the energy will spread out in the environment. So, that is called radiation damping and as a result decrease in specific energy. So, this is called uh, radiation damping, this is also called geometric damping or ge geometric att attenuation. So, three names are same. So, radiation damping is same as geometric damping or it is also called geometric attenuation. Okay. And this, this is due to geometry that, that is and it is not related to material property of the uh, medium rather than the waves are traveling far away then this is. Uh, so, this is called dispersated by viscous or static or other mechanism. So, now continue with this. So, what happens when an earthquake waves is released from a fault which is below the ground surface, body waves travel away from the source in all directions. So, body waves will travel all together, body waves will go up and this will go up, this will go down, this side or uh, like you know in 3D case this side down, this side, this side, this side all the six, six direction it will be going. So, this is the case here. But in case of geometric attenuation, there is a geometric attenuation causes the amplitude of the body waves to decrease at a rate of 1 by r. So, you can say this is linked, this uh, second point is linked with the body wave. So, this 1 by r is related to body waves. So, uh, this is rate of attenuation. While for the surface wave, the rate of attenuation is 1 by root r, geometric attenuation, 1 by root r, geometric attenuation. As a result, we can say because r is greater than 1. So, for the body waves rate of attenuation is faster than the surface waves. So, as a result when at a from when you go from away from the epicenter at a let us say a earthquake have come in uh, uh, if I say in uh, in the Himalaya near Badrinath. Hmm? So, when the waves will travel from here to in Rudki, so first wave will come P wave then you will get uh, S wave then you will get uh, this uh, rel uh, love wa uh, relative waves or surface waves. So, the body waves attenuate fastly 
and the signal of body wave which is coming here will be very diminished. But while surface waves attenuate is a slower rate, so their amplitude is uh, more at, at a, some distance away from the epicenter. So, this explains the greater proportion of surface wave motion that is commonly observed at large epicentral distance. That means, away from the epicenter you still feel there is a uh, uh, amplitude is good. So, this explains that why we should use the uh, surface wave magnitude rather than body wave magnitude for characterization of distant earthquakes. Suppose an earthquake have occurred long distance. So, better if we record the surface wave then we can uh, get some amplitude uh, in the body waves it is difficult. But another issue is here because it still have some amplitude. So, this will also explain why dam more damage is caused by surface waves or sur damage caused by surface waves is greater because rate of attenuation for surface wave is slower than the body wave. For problems in which energy is released from a finite source which is ranging from the large scale uh, for rupture along an earthquake fault to the smaller scale case of vibrating foundation radiation damping can be extremely important and in fact in such cases the effect of radiation damping often dominate those of material damping. So, you have radiation damping and on another side is material damping. So, total damping before I end, end up uh, uh, this lecture. So, you can say total damping will consist of material damping plus radiation damping. Now, which one will dominate? It will depends on your uh, frequency of uh, uh, like you know that uh, at what frequency you are. So, if you have the low frequency normally metal damping dominate at higher frequency normally this radiation damping dominates. So, this completes uh, this lecture and uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. So, with this lecture we are already completed the module 1. So, today this was the 10th lecture. So, that means we completed 5 chapter and I again you know this, intro, uh, this module 1 all 5 topics here uh, starting from introduction of this course to the wave propagation we finished. Now, then the next module we are going to start one of the most important topic of geotechnical earthquake engineering which is called dynamic properties of soil or what we call the uh, uh, properties of soil for dynamic loads. So, that we will uh, discuss and uh, what are the components we will dis discuss in the next uh, module module 2. So, thank you very much for your kind attention.